everybody, my name is Davina and I consider myself a systems physiologist. So that means like taking into account changes on the cellular level and how this may impact physiology and behavior. So my overall research interests are centered around energy metabolism and how this can shape the life of individuals. Now, if you have a look at my background, you'll notice I have a predominantly human and model organism background, but my projects always focus on some kind of disruption of energy metabolism and how this may impact health and reproduction. So during my PhD and continuing during my research assistant job and postdoc, I was involved in cetacean projects and trying to understand which mechanisms are regulated in response to disruptive foraging or other stressors. So specifically how the blubber might differ from the classic mammalian view we have. So I recently started my uh, research group at the University of Aberdeen, as Hannah said, and I use my expertise in energy metabolism to understand how and how cetaceans may differ from the classic mammalian mechanisms. So I mainly focus on four pillars, which I'll share, and I will share some of my work with you today. So I work in the framework of what we call the population consequences of multiple stressors, or PCOMs for short. So stressors caused by humans, for example, shipping tourism. Um, and naval activities and so on can impact the energy stores and health and reproduction of cetacean. So just to give an example, anthropogenic noise can cause displacement from a critical habitat or feeding grounds, and that can lead to disruptive foraging, can also increase stress, and it can impact the amount of energy that they can basically invest in reproduction and survival. So therefore, if you want to identify markers of health, it's really crucial that we understand how these mutable stressors can impact uh, survival and production, and then lead to changes in population, uh, population dynamics and cetaceans. So one of the commonly used indicators of health is energy stores or, or blubber thickness. So basically the amount of blubber they have. So I'll talk a little bit more on the work that we're doing related to blubber thickness and linking the energy status of uh, standard animals to their ecological health. So in model organisms, we know that fat is used as an energy storage and a certain amount of fat is associated with optimal survival and reproduction. So when an animal is exposed to foraging disruption, less energy will be available and energy stores will be used to supply this footage. So as you can see, the amount of fat that is present will actually decline. So however, as I said before, production is very costly from an energy point of view and to be able to survive, reproduction will be shut down. So there will be this trade-off between survival and reproduction. Now we know that when, um, sorry, the dog is working in the background. So we know that when excess food is available, this will also be stored in fat and fat tissue will expand. So this can cause a quite range of complications. So for example, we know that diabetes type two can also lead to poor reproductive habits. So this is the whole idea behind blubber thickness that unhealthy animals or poor animals basically will have uh, less fat available and that healthy individuals will have thicker fat stores. So, but we know that cetaceans have evolved to have that thickened blubber. So they, they do not have the same negative side effects of excess fat as we see in land mammals. So this could be already an occasion that blubber might not signal energy status in the same way as we see in um, land mammals. So now if we have a look at the association between blubber thickness and pregnancy rates. So this is work done by Willis, Williams et al, where they sampled pregnant North Atlantic uh, fin whales over several decades. So the y-axis is a proportion of pregnant individuals and the x-axis is the blubber thickness. So one of the first things you'll notice immediately is that with low amount of fat, there's also a low number of pregnancy. So this means there is a clear trade-off between energy available or basically the blubber thickness and reproduction. However, as you can see, when we increase the mean of blubber thickness, there's no change to pregnancy rate. So this indeed shows nicely that cetaceans have evolved to have uh, thicken blubber, and this may not impact their, their reproductive health in the same way as, as we see in land mammals. So if you have a closer look at the trade-off between survival and reproduction, so as I just showed in female North Atlantic uh, fin whales, there's a clear decline in pregnancy rates with lower blubber thickness. 
Now, another study at Minky Wells showed that those at poor body condition, so basically less, uh, having less fat available, that the fetus length was shorter compared to those with healthy mama fat. So, and also when there's a period of, of low food availability, it looks like early term abortion is a mechanism to save energy, as I said before, reproduction is very, very costly. So it does all suggest that the amount of energy that's being invested in fetus growth is reduced to optimize their own survival. So these examples, it looks like blubber thickness is a great predictor of reproductive health. But other studies have also shown that, uh, suggested that blubber thickness might actually be not a good indicator for health at all. So for example, some find lack of relationship between blubber thickness and non-pregnant females and males. In addition as well, across several species, there seems to be a poor relationship between health and blood thickness. So the data that is available seems to be very noisy. So for example, there's differences in sampling protocol, full depth and position where the blubber is taken. So in, in the paper of 2017 of Kirkshaw, she actually argued that muscle mass may be used as fuel during period, periods of starvation, as blubber, as we know, also has uh, other functions. So for example, blubber excitations is also used as sound regulations and buoyancy, and that's a direct consequence of their second adapter, uh, adaptation to life and water. So again, indication that the energy metabolism might not function in the same way, and that muscle breakdown might actually have more devastating results for their health. So we wouldn't pick up, we wouldn't pick that up with measuring blubber thickness. So this is, for example, uh, an example that both had well. So you have different blubber layers. So the top layer is mainly used for insulation. Then the middle one is used for energy reserve. And the bottom one, the bottom one is supposed to be involved in regulating energy metabolism. So there's blubber from fall for juvenile blubbers, uh, but there's also blubber for adults. So we'll just ignore the juveniles and have a look at adult blubber. So, as you can see, there's a blubber from fall when the animal is being fed, but you also have blubber from spring when the animals are being fasted. So as you see, there's no change in blubber thickness at all, but what you will notice is that the size of fat cells actually decline according when the animal is fasted. Another thing that seems to happen is that they incorporate more fibers into the structure. So that's mainly to, to maintain those, those structural function of blubber itself. So that means if you measure blubber thickness and, and this species specifically, is that the blubber thickness wouldn't change and you wouldn't be and you wouldn't and would conclude that the animal is, for example, healthy. So the question we then asked together with the Scottish Marine Animal Strand Scheme was, well, how good of a marker is blubber thickness really then? So they have historic data from 1991 from a wide range of species uh, of animals that strand on, on the Scottish coasts. And within, um, and within cetaceans, they have different sizes ranging from harbor porpoises to, to sperm males. They also take blubber thickness of three different positions, so uh, ventral, dorsal, and lateral. And when the animals strand, they get classified according to their cause of death. So either uh, trauma where the animal died uh, instantly, infectious diseases and others. So others is where they don't know exactly what the cause of that might be, but it could be, for example, fishnet entanglement or plastic in the stomach. So here are the plots for uh, lateral, um, dorsal and ventral uh, blubber thickness. And what I really stress here is that all of these pl three plots have exactly the same animals and exactly the same data. So as you can see, it depends on where you take your sample, uh, you will conclude differently about the blubber thickness. So as you can see this, for example, others here, when you take the lateral blubber thickness will tell a different story than these here. So that means that, that blubber thickness might not be a good marker of health and it varies according to species and all highly dependent on where you take your uh, sample. So for those that are interested to, to read more up on, on blubber thickness, um, we recently published a paper as well. So it's more a targeted review towards blubber thickness and, and the role of, of blubber in um, energy metabolism. So to go a little bit deeper into the blubber thickness as marker of health, uh, we set up this project where we link the ecological health to energy status of the animal. So again, samples were and are still currently being collected from uh, stranded animals. 
And the standing scheme collects a wide range of measurements like age, sex, body condition, pollutants, um, disease burden, but also diet and pathology. So instead of looking at blubber thickness, we look specifically at the cellular markers of energy status. Um, now, sadly, I do not have any exciting results to show as yet, as this kick started just before COVID and have sadly not been able to go back in the lab just yet. So it is a, a work in progress. Um, but yeah, so we're also collecting samples from different organs to look at um, markers there. So it's becoming quite clear that cetaceans might have different energy metabolisms compared to lab animals and that they may not use their adipose tissue or fat in a similar way. So what we really need here is novel health markers. But before we can do that, we need to understand how mechanisms related to changes in energy status are regulated. So this brings me to the next part of my presentation where I'll talk about the experiments we've been doing and how we're trying to find novel markers of health. So before I start showing some of the results, I'll sidetrack really quick and explain where the idea is coming from to detect novel health markers. So at this point, I'll just assume that everybody knows who the Hulk is, and for those that don't, it's really not crucial to, to, to follow the explanation. So if we think as Dr. Banner as a healthy individual, and when he's exposed to certain disorders, he will change into the Hulk. So the Hulk in this analogy is a diseased individual. Now, ideally what we want to do is we want to pick up a signal before Dr. Banner becomes the Hulk, if we want to prevent that. So, if you, so we want an early warning signal before the actual disease occurs. So the issue we face is that often a single marker is measured. So for example, blood thickness, but we know that biological regulations is way more complex than that. So we know there's many different mechanisms interacting with each other. So we can pick up those interacting molecules by what we call uh, networks. So we can construct, construct networks. So the example I give here is based on genes, but that can be applied to, to many other molecules as well. So for example, molecule, uh, for example, Dr. Banner has a certain gene expression and the Hulk is associated with another gene, ex uh, gene expression. So we know that many genes interact with each other and we should take into account all the dynamics of gene expression. So one gene will interact with another gene that will interact with another one and so on, and it will form what we call a gene interaction network. So that network state, this one, is then specifically associated with Dr. Banner. Now, if he changes into the Hulk, you'll see that the network changes as well. So it is those changes in network structure that we can pick up, pick up before the actual disease occurs. So when a, a network transitions from one network state, state into another one, it, it's shown that there will be increase in information flow until the new network state is reached. Uh, during my PhD, I worked on the transcriptomic responses of foraging disruptions um, in a model organism, and I built whole transcriptomic interaction networks. So here are the, the networks for normal aging, uh, for normal foraging, and here are the ones for disrupted foraging. And the links, as you can see here, basically resemble the information flow. So as you can see, when the net network transitioned from this network into network, as you can see, I was able to pick up that transition until the network state of reduced foraging was achieved. So you can see there's way more connections happening in these networks as the network transitions. So what can network biology really tell us then? So first of all, what it can tell us is how well connected a network is. So if you look at the network here, you'll notice that some of these genes are more connected than others. So and it's, it's been found that networks associated with diseases actually lose some of their network connectivity, and that's something we can measure. So something what we can do as well is we can identify central genes. So these genes are very important in the network. So for example, if you would remove this gene, it would have more devastating results than, for example, removing this gene. Now, interestingly, genes can also change their network role without changing their expression. So this is work again from my PhD, where I looked at the foraging. So you have no foraging to increase foraging disruptions and 
here are the list of the central genes. So as you can see, um, so this resembles gene expression. As you can see, there's very little changes in gene expression. Um, so, but now if you look at the eigenvector values, so eigenvector values is a measure for how important that gene is in the network compared to others. So as you can see, this changes with, um, as it changes your, your foraging disruption. So you see that these genes that are important here when there is no foraging disruption, will become less um, important when there is foraging disruption. Now, another advantage with network biology is that we can take our, our gene or here and basically overlap that with known pathways, known biological pathways. So we can look at a change of interaction within pathways. But another thing we can do as well is we can change in the, in changing the interaction between pathways. So this can be, for example, a change in, in the interaction between um, energy metabolism and inflammation. So now we've taken that little detour, I can show you some of the results of the experiments we've done to mimic uh, disrupted foraging in bottlenose dolphins. So the MMP maintains approximately about 80 bottlenose dolphins and they are trained in, in different tasks. So an example is they can detect objects in the water. And also a subset is trained for voluntary blubber biopsies and blood, sam uh, blood sampling. So this opens up an avenue to do some experimental work on these animals. So in this experiment, uh, the animal was fasted overnight and blood samples were taken during a fasting state and the fat state. So blood was collected and metabolites were identified in the plasma. So for those who don't know what metabolites are, so we have our DNA, our genomics, and then that gets transcribed into RNA or transcriptomics, and then this gets translated into proteins or proteomics. And then that gets metabolized with the other um, food that we eat, and then the end product is metabolomics. So metabolomics is really the snapshot of what's happening with our metabolism. So this is the principal component analysis of the metabolite profiles from the animals that were pre and post fasted. Um, so as you can see, there's a quite nice separation between the two profiles. So this indicates that the, metabol that the metabolic signature between the pre and post fasted were different. So the next question we can then ask is, well, how different are they? So we contrasted the, the post versus the pre fasted samples and certain metabolites showed up as being significantly different. So if you look at the graph here, you see that the log default changes are on the x-axis and the minus log adjusts the p-value here. So the metabolites are colored according to the role in metabolism. So as you can see, the majority of metabolites identified as lipids are increased, while those related to uh, amino acids are reduced. So next, we constructed uh, the metabolite interaction networks um, of the two metabolic signature to ad identify any network changes. So the way in which metabolites cluster ch change completely, so the metabolite with the greatest eigenvector centrality, so the eigenvector value is uh, what we measure to identify the most important gene in the network. So that value changed between the two networks and, um, and basically the role in the network changed as well. So another thing that we noticed as well, that there was a module uh, uh, emerging in the post-fasting, and this group basically all the metabolites with the largest eigenvector value. So all the metabolites that were important basically got reclustered in this massive, what we call dynamical network marker. Now, this is a method that's been used for early disease detection in other fields, so for example, medicine. So the next step we can do is that we can map the metabolites in this uh, dynamical network worker to literature-based biological pathways. And when we did that, it was quite clear that it was a shift towards lipid utilization. So the pathways uh, that were analyzed showed that lipids become more available and there is some indication of beta oxidation. So beta oxidation is when you have to break down of lipids for uh, energy. So there's also less amino acids in circulations, and this might be because of gluconeogenesis. But this is a stark contrast to what we know of model organisms. So when a model organism is starved, first, any remaining glucose left on the diet will be used up. 
then, then glucose stored as glycogen will, will be used from liver. And when this is depleted, gluconeogenesis will kick in. Now, gluconeogenesis is a new formation of glucose, from example, amino acids, so basically proteins. So if you have a look at the starvation phases, the first phase is using up your glycogen. So it's fine. Then there's a, sw uh, a shift towards your gluconeogenesis, and then lipid usage kicks in to protect our muscles from breakdown. Now, we found no indication uh, in the blood of these 24 hour starved bottlenose dolphins that they were using up glycogen as an energy store, but we saw a clear shift toward, towards protein breakdown and lipid usage. So, this could potentially mean that during starvation, dolphins really re rely more on, on amino acids as a glucose torch. Source, so that would have severely effects on their muscle mass. So lipids cannot be converted into glucose, but it can be converted into ketones. So, however, currently I haven't found any papers showing that dolphins are able to rely on that on ketones. So, if somebody knows otherwise, I would greatly appreciate some discussion around that topic. So, when a model organism is starved, there's a decline in glucose levels. So, however, dolphins, um, there's an increase in glucose level after starvation. So why is glucose so important in sensations? So like humans, dolphins have large brains and brains and red blood cells are the, are the only organs that are solely reliant, reliable on glucose as fuel. Um, however, they have a diet almost devoid of carbohydrates and a diet rich of protein. Hence, it would be expected that the formation of glucose from amino acids or muscles would be a key process. So again, this nicely supports uh, Clark Shaw's idea that protein from muscle may be a key fuel, fuel during starvation for, to basically protect that blubber layer. So as I mentioned as well, the most important metabolites in the network changes as well to GPC. So this basically is involved in counteracting the effects of urea on, enzy on enzymes and other uh, macromolecules and urea the formation of urea is basically linked to gluconeogenesis. So again, this ties in, in, in the whole story of, of amino acids being con converted to, to glucose. So lastly, there's also a decrease in activity in IL-10 signaling and also a decrease in am amino acid biosynthesis, which makes completely sense that amino acids are not being built up. Um, so IL-10 is, uh, is involved in uh, basic complete downstream of uh, uh, IL-10, it's involved in cell growth, survival, and apoptosis. So the 24-hour salvation study indicated that there was a switch towards lipid utilization and breakdown of amino acids to form glucose. So next you can ask, well, how does this, this translate then to wild population of bottlenose dolphins? So this is, a, is the HERA project. So it, it's a project that focuses, a, focuses on health and environmental risk of several dolphins. And the population I'll talk about here is currently off the coast in South Carolina. So it's uh, located there in Charleston Harbor. So these animals were temporarily restrained and examined. So they were either classified as having a normal um, health or having a challenged ecological health. So again, blood was collected from these animals and we used metabolomics. So besides metabolomics, we also did a blood chemistry analysis. So in red, you can see the animals that have a normal health. And then in um, blue, you have the animals that have a challenge ecological health. So as you can see, similar to, to um, starvation in bottlenose dolphins, glucose levels are actually increased in animals with a chance ecological health. And then um, if you look on the bottom, you have your stress hormones there. So as you can see, um, those animals with a challenge ecological health had actually increased in stress levels as well. So then we looked at the metabolic profile of these animals. So you have your uh, animals that are, are normal, with normal health, and then you have your animals that have a challenge ecological health. So again, there was a very nice separation between uh, these two different groups of animals. And then you can ask, well, what exactly is different between two metabolic profiles? So I mapped biological uh, pathways on top of, of those uh, metabolites that were different. And this is the result. So again, similar to um, the 24-hour reservation, um, 
we saw there was a, a shift towards uh, amino acids. The amino acids weren't being used up as a fuel. Um, however, we do. However, if you look at at the uh, at the fatty acid one um, and other ones related to lipid metabolism, there was actually very little pathways related to that. So to quickly summarize the, the work we've done uh, with the HERA project. So dolphins with a, with, a, with a challenged ecological health had indeed high stress levels and they had higher glucose levels. And the shift towards amino acids again would suggest a protein breakdown. Um, but in, in contrast, what we found that in the 24 hour starvation study is that we actually did not see a switch towards lipid. So it's one thing to look at, at animals that are being starved, and then there's another one, and there's another thing to look at animals that have a disease or are unhealthy. Um, so what we currently face is, is, is this knowledge gap. So if you really want to find novel markers of health, we need to start unraveling how energy metabolism is regulated in cetaceans and how multiple stressors impact this. So we need to, just to take a step back, and you might have heard me mention a few times that we first need to know which, mechanism, which mechanisms might be altered through um, evolution, basically. So this takes me to the last part of my presentation where I'll talk about the work we've done on comparative genomics together with uh, colleagues at the University of Aberdeen. Um, so we know that cetaceans underwent a adaptation to aquatic lifestyle approximately a few million years ago, and this brought in lots of different uh, changes, for example, changes to their anatomy, but also physiology, and not surprising to their metabolism. So what, what, the one that everybody knows is that they've got a liver. Um, so what we did in this project is we compared 16 uh, cetacean species versus 37 artiodactyl species, and rather again than looking at a single gene level, what we did in, in this case is we looked at specific pathway level. And those pathways were related to sensing the, the energy status of, um, yeah, just basically pathways involved in how they would signal uh, energy status. So there were several uh, different pathways affected, but I'll just keep to two uh, pathways today. So I'll talk about the insulin signaling pathway and the of couple of uh, pathway. So this is the in, uh, insulin signaling pathway. So glucose can always enter uh, the cell quite, quite freely with um, these um, transporters. So however, when insulin is present, so insulin is a hormone secreted by the pancreas. So whenever there's food in our system, this will be secreted and insulin can bind to uh, the receptor that will cause a signaling cascade. And basically what's gonna happen is more transporters will be uh, brought to the surface to basically uh, increase the glucose entry. So why are we looking at uh, insulin signaling pathway? So this is uh, data again from bottlenose dolphins. Um, so you have the minutes on the x-axis and insulin on the y-axis. So you have fasting and you have uh, animals that were fed about, uh, basically glucose dosage. So as you can see, when the animals are fasted, we see very low response in insulin. And the same is true for glucose as well. So if you, you would expect, if you would feed an animal in, in glucose, you would expect to see a peak of glucose going up right away. And then once the glucose is taken up, it would go down. So, so clearly insulin signaling is not working in a similar way here in, in cetaceans. So it could be that this part of, of the signaling cascades are completely so this is what we've done then. So we look specifically at number two. So this is exactly the same as, as number two, but only in, in, in uh, genes. So heavy insulin there with your insulin receptor, and then you've got signaling cascade going down in uh, the cell basically. So the purple ones were the ones that showed uh, evolutionary change compared to the um, artiodactyls. And then we did a prediction of what the impact might be of these genes on, on the signaling cascade. So blue means that there is an inhibition. So as you can see, because of the changes to these genes specifically, the signaling cascade of the insulin path pathway is basically what we would call knocked out. So then the next pathway I want to talk about is the NF-kappa-beta pathway. So if you remember from the beginning of my presentation, 
um, we have a healthy amount of, of fat and then when there's too much uh, energy available, it will be stored and, and your fat tissue will expand. So basically this is what's going to happen. So you have that uh, extension. So that tissue will become inflamed and very unhealthy basically. Um, but this, this does not seem to happen in situations. So they have such a huge blubber, fat layer of blubber that, that, that you would expect them to have some inflammation in there, but that doesn't happen. So one of the main pathways related to inflammation is in of copper beta, and also directly links into the whole trade-off of reproduction and being in, in a poor condition as well. So again, this is the pathway of NF kappa beta. So we've got the purple ones that were changed and then the blue ones, prediction of the inhibition. So as you can see, it's, it's the entire signaling cascade of the NF kappa beta uh, pathway that was affected. So just to quickly summarize the comparative genomics bit. So, so adaptations, uh, so it looks like indeed cetaceans have an adaptation to glucose poor diets and as expected insulin might not play the same role in energy balance either. Um, and then secondly, it points to adaptation likely to reduce the health consequences of adiposity as well, which would be we expected already. So just to conclude my talk here, what we really need is more experimental work to start unraveling and we start understanding how energy metabolism is regulated in cetaceans and which signaling molecules have an effect on whole body functioning. So for example, the prime one is the role of protein or muscle as an energy source and what are the consequences for health. So once we've got a good understanding of how these mechanisms and physiology works, we can start unraveling what the impact is of these multiple stressors on our production and, and, and survival. So it's quite key that we start really understanding how these animals respond to stressors and what the impacts might be on their health for um, conservation purposes and for their population dynamics as well. So I'd like to thank a few people um, that were involved in, in the different projects. So we've got to, the comparative genomics people. So uh, Marius Wenzel was my informatician that did all the, the lovely comparative genomics work for me. Um, and then we've got uh, Dorian Hauser, Alex and, and David that worked on the experimental manipulations and then we've got uh, um, Pat, Mark and Alex and doctors as well uh, who's working on the impact of stresses in all populations and then we've got people with stranding scheme in Scotland as well. Um, so I'll just leave that there. Um, I am looking to collaborate so if people are interested um, pop me an email um, and I'll happily have a chat with you as well. So I'll happily take any questions now. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, that talk, Davina. That was really interesting. You crammed a lot in. Well done. Um, <laughs> We are, yeah, for anyone who's watching and has a question, please pop it in the Q&A that is at the bottom of your screen. And Davina, Davina and I can work through that and answer those questions. If you're watching on YouTube, please just pop it in that box that is at the bottom of the screen where it says submit a question here, and we'll be able to answer that question too. So um, I had a question uh, which related to your work on the, the HERA project, um, and this might have already been explained, so sorry if it, I missed that bit. Um, can you just explain a bit more about what challenged ecological health actually meant? Because you had healthy and then just this, and I wasn't too yeah. sure what that kind of meant. What were those criteria? Because you did mention earlier, you know, the, uh, the animals that were stranded, um, yeah. they were either, yeah. there was separate categories. So I was just wondering if you could explain that a bit. Yeah, so um, those that have a, that had an ecological challenge health were those animals that mainly um, had signs of inflammation as well. So... Uh, and had diseases, so the vets, um, so there were the vets that ended, identified if the animals had, had any, you know, inflammation, stuff like that. And this was also matched to their blood profiles, for example, white blood cells were, were measured as well. So if any of these animals showed any immune responses to any diseases, they were not classified as healthy. So it was all based on, on um, cutoffs by, by veterinary people and so on. Mm -hmm. And that was, was that a wild population that yes, you were so taking was, these samples yeah. from? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Great. And so it was, I don't, you've obviously got data previously from strandings uh, as well. And then you have this wild population that you've looked at. I was wondering if there was any work at all on captive uh, dolphins as well. 
Um, um, it's it's something in, in, in progress. Um, so uh, I know that lots of people have worked specifically at stress levels. So they've looked at stress levels in, in captive versus wild dolphins. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. So some of them have less stress levels, some of them have more depending on, on how to take your samples. Um, but yeah, obviously the, the animals in, in the captive uh, and captive situation have less of that, what we call ecological challenge, helps because they're in prime, clean conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but it's, it's something I'm trying to get started as well. Excellent, yeah. Uh, we've got a question just in from Laura asking um, about the amino acid breakdown. Do you have an idea on how long that extrapolate, how, uh, wait, do you have an idea on how, would that extrapolate to migrating whales who are fasting for much longer periods? Yeah, hi, hi Laura, brilliant question. Um, sadly, not yet, um, but so if you remember the example I, I gave from, from the bowhead whale, so it looks like these animals are using up their fat stores, um, but I think the, the issue really comes in is when, when they go through that fasting period and then another stressor kicks in. So they're doing their migration very nicely. They're relying on a fat, fat store that's there. But for example, once another stressor could come in, the animal could, could get really stressed. If cortisol, cortisol levels might go up and they need to trigger their fight or flight reaction. So once that triggers, you know, they would need way more energy to be able to do that. And that's, that's where the amino acid breakdown would come in as well. So to be able to, to supply that energy, there might be more breakdown of, of proteins and so on as well. So it's also related to, to fasting noise, but could be, for example, related to contamination as well. So if, if there's more um, PCBs in, in present as well, so that, that can have a, a severe impact on uh, the energy metabolism. So ideally, when an animal is in perfect conditions, perfectly healthy, you would expect that the migration and fasting would be very nicely monitored and very nicely regulated. But once you start adding that extra level of, of stressor, that's when quite likely they, they have to rely more on the muscle mass, basically. And that's where it gets a bit more um, dangerous for them. That's what I would expect. Thank you, Laura. No, thank you, Davina, as well, for that, that answer. Um, so you have a couple of papers that are in review coming out. So um, what can we expect from that, sorry? Yeah, so um, the papers I currently have in review is the comparative genomics paper. So hopefully um, that's currently staying in review as well. And then got two, the two metabolomics papers should hopefully be submitted soon. I should be hopefully coming out there. Um, but basically the, yeah, the, the summary I gave here is, is a take, yeah, take home message of, of what's happening in those papers as well. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we haven't got any other questions to work through at the minute. So if any of our attendees have uh, a burning question that they want to type in, please type it in right now and we'll be able to work through that. Alternatively, you can raise your hand uh, and I can uh, unmute you and you can ask it over audio too. Um, and we can get through to that question as well quite quickly. Um, I guess I would ask any other points that you would like to raise whilst we have this opportunity to talk and we have our attendees listening. So oh, when you uh, looked, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, so when sorry, you looked no. at blubber thickness allocations, did you look at species specific differences and blubber storage? Example, Belene store, uh, Dorsey and Tutit Fantrilli. No, I haven't yet, which is actually a really good point. Um, so that's something I could look at. Um, yeah, so no, I haven't looked at that specifically. Thank you. Uh, next question from Cormac asking, uh, could you talk more about the potential value for cetaceans of foraging on fatty fish versus protein rich fish prey species for animals in different nutritional states? Yes, um, yeah, so basically uh, the prime example here is, is, is a killer whale. So some of them, so some of them only rely on um, on fish, while other ones also can choose eating between seals and, and fish, for example. Um, so this is some work I've come that, that, that we're going to start doing as well, is look how, how well adapt they are. Um, and if the protein rich ones might 
to my my idea of the protein rich ones might be a bit more beneficial because they they will have more uh, amino acids in there um so if you have a fish that's quite rich in, in, in amino acids and proteins for example so there will be more proteins available to be converted into glucose which we know that glucose is one of the of the key uh requirements for the brain and stuff like that so i would expect that those that eat um less like just more the fat, fatty fish they might have more issues than the protein rich fish ones but it's really difficult because all these different cetaceans um so i've, I've kept it quite broad based on 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 cetaceans but we have to realize that for example very small harbor porpoises are completely different to um to sperm whales so not only are we dealing with the changes uh, from land mammals to cetaceans but we're also changing with like really species specific changes and right now we don't really have a good, good grasp of what the species specific physiology is so right now it's, it's just being me um hypothesizing that those that eat fatty fish um might have more issues than those eating protein rich fish but that's something we should really look into and and try to understand more on the species level as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you our next question asks uh regarding your findings on the evolution of the nfkb pathway in cetaceans could this be linked to the evolution of immune responses in an aquatic environment compared to a terrestrial one Yes, good question, Fabio. Um, yes, it could be. Um, so I haven't looked at the immu immune responses yet as well. Um, but yes, and I've got better and, and these very nice links in with, with the immune responses as well. Um, so that's something you should look at as well. Thank you, Fabio. The next question comes from uh, Stefan asking, can animals with large energy stores be more vulnerable to overheating, for instance, uh, if they're swimming harder for a couple of hours to get away from pile driving? Okay, good question. Um, so, so it looks like the, the, really, the really big animals that have the larger energy stores, they, they, don't, have, they don't have functional, what we call UCP1. So UCP1 is one of that main um, is one of the main uh, uh, genes or, or or that is related to thermogenesis. So basically, um, so what happens in in, in most um, mammals is when you've got your electron transport chains and electrons um, go happily along it, and then when they need to make heat, uh, the, that UCP1 is basically a uh, uncoupling protein that produces heat when the when when the um, the H plus ones go down. So it looks like the really big ones don't have that at all. So it looks like their, their heat is, is very, um, very tightly regulated by the massive insulin stores as well. So it doesn't look like they have that uncoupling um, mechanism at all. So, so I don't think there will be any issues with that with overheating at all. Oh, that's good to know. I didn't even think that dolphins could, could overheat actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, we haven't got any other questions to work through. So again, just a reminder to any of our attendees, if you have questions, please type in right now uh, for Davina and I to work through. Uh, and again, if you saw a slide that you thought was really interesting, and you'd like to look back, this entire session has been recorded and is gonna be on YouTube by the end of today. So you can look back at this and also hear um, Davina talk again about any of these topics that she has mentioned today. Um, I can't see any other questions coming in. So um, I guess that leaves me to say thank you very much, Davina, for a very stimulating talk, uh, crammed full of information. And thank you for answering today's questions. Thank you, Hannah, for organizing it. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. For uh, anyone who is still with us, um, I would just like to highlight the uh, talks that we have coming up as well. So if you really enjoyed Davina's talk and you see a title here that also interests you, please just register using um, the uh, registration link that you've used before and you'll be able to join us in any of our upcoming webinars. Our last webinar of the series is the 2nd of September. So um, that you'll be able to get your marine fix before our annual science meeting until then. So, uh, yep, please register if you see a talk that you like.